Uh, okay, so hello everyone. Welcome to this uh, third panel uh, dedica uh, dedicated today to the meaning of artificial faces. Um, thank you very much to all the organizers. First of all, uh, Professor Nicola Sorindragan. Sorry for my terrible pronunciation of your name, but uh, uh, as you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm Italian. Um, well, the panel today is composed by me, uh, by uh, Emiliano Vargas and by Cristina Voto. Um, okay. I'm, uh, uh, I'm gonna respect the, the, the original schedule, so I, I will uh, speak first. Um, I set our presentations, uh, let's say in 20, 25 minutes, uh, maybe, uh, 25 uh, uh, as a maximum. Sorry. Florina, your mic is on. Okay, okay, thank okay you. sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, mm, so 25 minutes maximum. And in order to have uh, some time for the final discussion. Uh, so I think I, it's, it's quite strange, but I, I just briefly present myself. I'm Bruno Surace from the University of Turin. I'm a, post, I'm a postdoc uh, fellow in the process facets, which is the project uh, uh, which uh, um, hosts uh, the, uh, this panel today. Uh, and uh, I work in the University of Turin as an uh, adjunct professor of semiotics and of cinema and audiovisual communication. I think I can start, so I share my screen. I just ask, uh, uh, well, maybe I share the screen like this. And I ask to Christine and Emiliano if they can see it. Yes, we can go okay. for it. Okay, thank you. So I start. Uh, well, the title of my presentation uh, uh, is uh, Figure, Figural and Disfigurement, Semiotics of the Disfigured Face in the Cinema. Um, I'm just going to present some notes uh, on this theme because it's a very complex theme and also very, semiotically speaking, uh, uh, technical theme because uh, uh, this word uh, uh, figure and figural uh, are words we use uh, in our discipline, but uh, as we know, they are surrounded by a kind of uh, mystery because if we, if we speak uh, uh, about uh, figures uh, or about figural, uh, um, we usually know what, uh, what are saying, but we, 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 we utilize these words as a kind of uh, uh, meta concept. So, the first part of my presentation is a reflection about these words and about how can we um, establish uh, the contours of these uh, uh, semiotic categories and then how they are related to, to the theme of the disfigurement, uh, which is a, a theme uh, or the disfiguration, let's say, let's say uh, a theme related to face. Uh, here, you, uh, you see this, I, I know it's not a very uh, wonderful image, uh, this is an image taken from a movie um, about Kukisake Onna. Uh, Kukisake Onna uh, refers to a, a Japanese uh, urban legend. Uh, this legend is about this uh, uh, beautiful woman um, who is too beautiful and who has a too jealous uh, uh, partner uh, who decides to uh, cut uh, her mouth uh, in order to um, to preserve uh, this kind, this woman as uh, its his own uh, property, and uh, and so uh, the legend says that this is the ghost of the woman uh, walking through the cities uh, uh, during the night and uh, um, asking for her revenge. But uh, um, it it is just a, a way to introduce you visually to the theme of this figurement because this image in some way creates in us. A kind of discomfort. It's not a beautiful image, as I said. So if we want to ask ourselves something about the word figure, of course, uh, philologically speaking, we can go um, back to ancient times. I have no time to do this, so, so uh, I, I start uh, from Fontanier, uh, because Fontanier is quoted, is directly quoted by Jorah Genette, 
uh, in the first uh, uh, volume of his uh, trilogy, uh, a trilogy which is, um, let's say, uh, meaningfully uh, entitled Figures. So in the first uh, volume, Figures 1, uh, immediately uh, the, the, the quotation by Fontanier um, says that uh, the notion of figures in, is in some way uh, connected with the notion of body. Uh, in some way, there is this relationship, and this relationship is not so obvious uh, if we see it from our guises, because uh, when we talk about figures, uh, many times we use this word uh, um, related to literary context. Uh, the same Je Jeanette uh, uh, himself uh, sp speaks about figures uh, uh, as something related to uh, literature, to verbal text, but uh, uh, wants to point this connection with the idea of body. And body is another kind of meta-theoretical concept we use, but uh, sometimes we have no clear definition of what a body is. Uh, so uh, quoting uh, Jeanette, uh, figure has to be meant as a semiotic surplus of the body, something more that is added to a, a, a body. It's an ambiguous device that means more than the literal expression and ensures that the expression acquires a, a surplus of meaning and, for example, that it can designate not only an object, a fact, a thought, but also their affective or their literary dignity. So we we have another, uh, another step, the fact that uh, through figures, uh, we can designate something affective, something connected with a kind of literary dignity. And then, this was my starting point. I, I, I tried to search for the word figure in a dictionary. As I said, I'm Italian, so I searched for it in, in one of the main uh, uh, Italian dictionaries, uh, the great dictionary of the Italian language, Il Grande Dizionario della Lingua Italiana. Uh, which, of course, uh, has uh, several pages ded dedicated to the word figure, uh, but uh, there is a point where the figure is defined as uh, the external appearance of a thing as it can be represented visually or described in relation to other forms. So here we have the mention to the word forms, uh, uh, and in some way, the fact that the definition says in relation to other forms uh, seems to suggest that uh, figure and form can be, in a, in a certain way, synonyms. So if we say figure or if we say form, we are basically saying the same thing. Um, and the other thing is that figure is defined holistically. So uh, we can detect a figure because we can detect other figures uh, which surround the, the, the previous one. And this is very semiotic because, uh, as uh, uh, Ferdinand de Saussure uh, <laughs> said to us, uh, the meaning uh, uh, arises from differences. So, in some way, figures uh, signalate, designate the differences in a formal way. So, as I, as I write here, we deduce that the possible breadth of the concept of figures makes it a sort of common denominator of some of the broadest and most discussed territories of semiotics, where to find the difference. And that, however, within it gravitate a series of rather problematic meta-concepts because it's related to concepts as representation, visuality, forms, body. And here we start to think about if there is a figure, maybe there is also a disfigure. <laughs> so something which is not a figure. As I write, the relationship between the figured and the disfigured begins to become clear, clearer. Disfigured, if we think about a face, because the first meaning related to disfigured in our common language is the face, a face disfigured, is in fact that face whose shape whose form ceases to be in clear relationship with others, presenting unexpected interstitialities, porosities, place margins, thresholds that undermine its original state of, as a figure. So a disfigured phase, by this perspective, if you want to attach our idea of disfigurement to this notion of figures, is a, is a phase with a kind of uh, 
um, with a contour with some porosity with not so not anymore able to distinguish between uh, its original form and the other forms which surround it. I know it's very technical and, and I'm sorry about it, but uh, this is a prestigious uh, conference of semiotics, so we speak about uh, formal uh, things too. Uh, also, of course, it's, uh, it's um, necessary to, men to mention uh, Fontanil, because Fontanil uh, works uh, a lot uh, uh, on the theme related to bodies uh, and, and to figures. And uh, Fontanil says that in order for a figure to be considered as a body, it must be, be made up uh, on the one hand of a material structure contained in an envelope. Again, this idea of uh, the figure is something uh, uh, which separates uh, something which is contained and something external. And on the other, by an energy and the potential for movement. This idea of the figure as something uh, capable of moving itself. And this is strictly connect to the other notion I wanted to talk about, the figural. Because figural is a word, is a word which has at least two macro histories. We, there, is, there are occurrences of the word figural in, let's say, postmodern philosophy, in Lyotard, uh, but also if, if we want to go back in Auerbach, etc. And there is a semiotic history of the word figural, um, there are references to figural in the dictionary by Gremas and Cortes, uh, and so on and so forth. Here, for example, we, I have, uh, um, th there is this source, uh, which is a quite recent source. It, this is one of the la latest book by Paolo, Paolo Pabri, Vedera d'Arte, a book dedicated to the semiotic of visual works of art. And uh, um, there is the idea that, uh, again, of the uh, energy, the idea of a figural energeia, uh, which uh, uh, Fabri calls perspicuitas or perspicuitas. Um, and again, the reference to the body, the last quotation, the presence of the body persists and is revealed in its supporting and acting structure, a diagrammatic figural scheme of an individual model abstracted from its own physiognomic mask that is from its history and identity. Uh, here, I, I just collected the other few quotations. The one is from uh, Gabriele Marino. Uh, Gabriele Marino uh, says uh, that the figural is the device that allows the conversion from plastic to enunciative structures. Uh, um, so opening up to the, to the dimension of the discourse and therefore to the different substantialization of the material formed, uh, Francesco Galofaro, uh, who, while uh, reviewing uh, the book by Nicola Dusi, Contromisure, um, says that the notion of figural is still ambiguous. So we have some notions of figural, but we are, these notions uh, are work in progress notions. And also the, the, ref the reference to Calabrese. What I'm interested in is that, uh, is that uh, by Gremas and Cortes uh, in the dictionary, in the very famous dictionary of um, semiotic and theory of language, there is uh, the notion of figural, and they say that the figural is uh, this strange uh, interstitial place between the plastic and the figurative level uh, into, um, into the images. So as we know, as we all know, uh, by Gremas, uh, um, in order to uh, extrapolate the meaning of an image, we know that there are two different levels uh, uh, which work together. The plastic level related to forms, related to lines, related to colors, and so on and so forth, and the figurative ones. Uh, the level where these uh, plastic elements uh, in some way become uh, culturally connotated. Well, there is a vacuum between these two levels, the, 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 the energia, the energy of the movement, which is represented by the figural. And my thesis is that uh, the figurally, the figure, figural, sorry, uh, it's not a void space, but it's an ideological space. So the passage from the plastic to the figurative is a culturally ideological uh, um, movement. Uh, and not only a perceptual one. And so, this was the first uh, theoretical part. Now we try to 
verify the, the few things that I said uh, through uh, examples taken from cinema. Uh, there is uh, basically a cinema of disfigured characters. Uh, cinema is full of reflections about faces. The close-up uh, is one of the um, main grammar elements of movies. Movies are full of faces, uh, but movies are also full of uh, deviant, uh, uh, abnormal phases. And these phases are utilized as specific devices in order to represent something. Here, I collected uh, uh, four different frames from, from four different scenes from four different eras and countries, because we have uh, um, Wild Strawberries by uh, Bergman, Macbeth, uh, the representation, the cinematographic representation of Macbeth by Polanski, Spellbound by Hitchcock and Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. And here we have four different uh, disfigured face. And here disfigurement means that the fact that these faces are represented without some of the basic elements which usually compose them. So we see uh, faces without uh, uh, anything, uh, faces with, without uh, only with the traits, but without uh, uh, the organs in the right place. Here we have uh, in Macbeth, we see the mouth, but we cannot see the eyes because they are covered and so on and so forth. So here we have in a, in a situation of rarefaction of facial features, uh, features, sorry. And the fact is that uh, all these images are related to an oniric dimension. So here there is the ideological level. The fact that uh, a, a disfigured face uh, uh, immediately refers to a kind of otherness, uh, to another context, uh, to a context which is ontologically situated into another dimension um, besides uh, the uh, ontological dimension we live in. Um, but uh, as we know, um, in reality, disfigured phases exist. They exist because of uh, um, problems, uh, um, natural problems, but also because of uh, artificial problems. Let's think of, I don't know, um, people uh, who experienced accident, people uh, who have been attacked by other people and uh, um, become disfigured and so on and so forth. So disfiguration has to be meant as a semiotic and semiotic question. The semiotic, uh, the semioticality of these questions is uh, in the ideological idea of figurality behind the disfigurement. So um, where we detect disfigurement and why? Uh, we have lots of cases also in the real uh, strict contemporarity. For example, there is this kind of new quite codified pathology called self-dysmorphia, which is a kind of symbolic disfigurement. Uh, it's quite proved by psychological uh, studies that uh, our uh, practices related to the selfies are becoming something obsessive and we are not anymore uh, um, capable to accept uh, our resemblance. And we always search for uh, uh, filters and also uh, society like the American Society of uh, Facial uh, uh, Plastic Surgery says that uh, something like half of the people uh, who ask for plastic facial surgery ask uh, for it in order to uh, make the perfect selfie. So there is a change in our proprioception, in our social proprioception section of the face, uh, which is a kind of symbolic disfigurement. We think that our faces uh, as they are, are disfigured. Um, and so the problem is that, uh, I, I resume it in, in two points, uh, the loss or conspicuous modification of facial features does not act only on the plastic level, but redefines the canonically figurative components of the face and calls for a drastic semantic change. Uh, so a disfigured person, a, an artificially disfigured person, person experiences a change, a dramatic change in her or his identity. And this is proved by psychology and also by cinema. We will see a couple of examples in a few minutes. And also that this disfigured person is from an aspectual point of view, 
in a kind of durative dimension. So the idea is that the proprioception of this pigment is aspectually speaking a durative uh, proprioception. And if we want to reach the figurative, uh, uh, sorry, the terminative aspectuality, I think that the passage is from disfiguration to transfiguration, uh, which is uh, a, a not, not uh, um, compulsory um, physical transfiguration, but, al but also a symbolic uh, transfiguration, a semiotic transfiguration. Here we have uh, two frames from this movie. I have no time to show you the images because uh, I'm talking uh, too much uh, from the social dilemma. Here you see in a um, brief sequence uh, the passage uh, from the, the, the idea of self dysmorphia. So the difference between looking at ourselves through the filters of an app and looking at ourselves through the mirror, uh, uh, where there is the passage between hypermediation and immediacy. But uh, if you want to read something about it, I, I, I wrote an article uh, in, uh, in 2020 about it, so you can uh, search for it. Um, and then finally, the cinema, the cinema of disfigurement. Uh, I have lots of examples. I want to show you just a, a couple of sequences. This is Vanilla, Vanilla Sky. Vanilla Sky is a very famous movie. It's a kind of remake from Abre los Ojos the, from, by Amenabar. And the protagonist, who is uh, Tom Cruise, a very handsome guy, after an accident, uh, um, sees himself uh, totally changed because of this new disfigured face. And um, I show you the scene. I hope you can hear vanity. and see. Comrades, this isn't about vanity. This is about functioning in the world. It's my job to be out there functioning. I've got the money. I'll pay any amount. Just invent something. Just play jazz. You say you're the best face man in New York? Fucking prove it. So he wants to have back uh, his uh, uh, previous face, uh, and this is the durative phase. Uh, he doesn't accept uh, his new face. Uh, he wants uh, something different. We could do something about your arm. Fuck my arm! <clears throat> Nobody here takes your feelings for granted. We did prepare something for you based on the preliminary examination. Tell me. Bring it on. It's sometimes useful in the early stages of rejection. It's a facial prosthetic. It was two weeks in the making. Thank you, Carly. A facial prosthetic. The aesthetic replacement does work, <laughs> emotionally and actually. And the plastic in the aesthetic shield also blocks out abusive rays and assists in the regeneration of cells. So it's an aesthetic regenerative shield. That's correct. Exactly. And the ergonomics of the plate barrier allows you to interact reflexively with the movements of your own face. I see. It's a helpful unit. Good. Because for a minute there, I thought we were talking about a fucking mask. It's only a mask. Here we have this uh, rage uh, attack uh, in confront of the mask. Other examples, uh, uh, maybe you you know a nightmare on on Elm Street. The character is a very bad character. Uh, he's a killer uh, who kills uh, uh, his victims uh, in their dreams. Uh, and it's characterized by this uh, burnt face, uh, which is the symbol of uh, his evil. But maybe you don't know Mr. Sardon Mr. Sardonicus. Uh, this is a movie by uh, William Castle in uh, 1961. And here again, um, we have a, a very a handsome guy as the main character who, um, for a kind of trauma, experiences uh, the uh, disfigurement and all the movie is played in uh, his fight in order to gain back uh, his original face. Uh, maybe I show you the scene and then I, I immediately stop. Sorry. I go a bit.
So he is digging in order to gain something. I don't want to spoil it. And uh, he sees this horrible skull with this strange smile. And then uh, as a kind of virus, this smile um, enters in his face. De repente recordé cuál era mi repugnante visión. El billete aún estaba en el bolsillo de su chaleco. I don't want to spoil the movie. Okay, I'm finishing. I have to cut about uh, uh, Connie Kalp. Connie Kalp was the first woman uh, who had uh, a, an entire face transplant uh, transplantation. Unfortunately, she died a couple of years ago for problems not connected to the uh, to her transplantation. Uh, and but as I said, there is a cinema. So my, I, one of my research main topics uh, is uh, today to work on this corpus of movies related to disfigurement. Examples are *The Years and Visage*, *Pieles*, a very good Spanish movie, uh, *Seconds* by John Frankenheimer. Uh, I go, I go, I go. The movies by David Lynch, um, *Scarface*, of course, *Circles of Horrors*, *The Elephant Man*. Uh, Mask, Johnny Handsome, The Man Without a Face, Black Dahlia, Dark Man, Maps to the Stars. As you can see, if we work on these themes, uh, we can find uh, lots of ideas and movies. Uh, as, I, as I said uh, uh, when I was starting, it was just a kind of a collection of notes. So I finished my presentation here because I don't want to, um, to, to steal time uh, from my co-guest uh, uh, speakers. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I leave the questions for the for the for the end, and I immediately present you uh, the next uh, speaker, uh, who is uh, Emiliano Vargas. Emiliano Vargas is master research fellow for the project Letter, Image, a Sound: Platforms and Social Networks, Relation Between Mediatization, Urban Space, and Culture of the National University of Buenos Aires, Argentina. Uh, he is member of the Semiotics Chair One. Graduated, graduated, sorry, in communication science from the National Universities of uh, University of Tucumán. His area of interest includes the production, circulation, and construction of, of art, and of, and the construction of the artist profile in the digital era, as well as the transformation of the modes of interaction between artists and public that digital platforms enable and disable. Uh, Emiliano today presents. Uh, uh, <coughs> paper uh, entitled Make Your Profile Yours, Spotify for Artists and Musical Uploading, Media Transformation in the Link of Musicians and Public. Thank you, Emiliano. Okay, I thank you for the presentation, Bruno. Let me share with us uh, the presentation. Uh, okay. You can see it? We see it. OK. Um, like Bruno said, the title of the presentation is Make Your Profile Yours, Spotify for Artists and Musical Uploading, Media Transformation in the Link of Musicians and Public. Um, along the presentation, I will expose some features, not only in Spotify, but in Campa in Bandcamp too. Now I'm going to explain it. Okay. Um, in this presentation, I will expose some mediatic change that have been registered 
within the artist audience link <clears throat> as a result of new meditations in musical life. Specifically, I will refer to features of the Bandcamp and Spotify music uploading process from a semiotic perspective of the digi uh, digital mediatizations. That is to say, I will describe some aspects that make up the mediatization of these platforms. I use the concept, two concepts uh, very important for this presentation. One is uh, the mediatization concept developed by Jose Luis Fernandez. From his perspective, mediatization should be analyzed from the study of three series that compose it, which, ha which have a life of relative independence from each other. There is technical device, genres and discursive styles and uses and social practice. The other concept uh, of our interest is the concept of interface uh, developed by Carlos Scolari. Interface is the, uh, almost in this case, is the space, the digital space where all these three series occurs and, uh, and where the interactions occur between the different type of uh, users. The other part of the methodology proposed by the semiotic of mediatization is a semi-historical approach to a media process. That is to say, to be able to reconstruct the temporal trajectory of the objects under construction in order to identify transformations and permanences in the media evolution. In this sense, it's important to highlight three major stages that the specialized literature divides. The first is uh, broadcasting, in which we deal with the boom stage of the model within the music industry. The second stage is called networking. We will see some features um, in a few minutes. <laughs> and finally, the post broadcasting. Uh, it's a concept developed by Jose Luis Fernandez, and this period in which the object that we have mentioned, um, uh, um, Spotify and Bandcamp and digital platforms, are situated. In, uh, this period is, char is characterized by a coexistence between uh, features of broadcasting and networking. Um, the, these three uh, moments have different interactional systems, and we will see some, some of them now. First, I will just say that the following is a summary of some particularities of the broad broadcasting boom moment in the music industry. The broadcasting moment is represented in a pyramidal structure seeks to a graph model, a communicational model, characterized by few senders or emitters and too many receivers. The music industry, although it covers a wide time spectrum, um, can be traced back to the creation of printed scores. Today, we are concerned with the peak of the industry, with the specialized literature place as from the breed of the phonograph and the sub -sub subconsequent development of the recording industry that is in the 20th century. The shame can be divided at the top of the pyramid into record levels and the mass media system at the bottom, the audience. <clears throat> okay. The following is a moment called networking the beginning of its consolidation can be dated in the 1990s, according to both semiotician, musicologists, and different type of researchers from fields linked to technological convergence. This historical period we segment in two moments. A first moment that we call downloading culture. The downloading culture is a social practice based on the practice of uploading file to websites. 
for a subsequent download. In other words, consumption mediatized by this practice. Among the sites that have crystallized in the history of the networking cosmos, we can highlight Ares, Torrent, Napster sites. This slide shows a piece of the uh, interface of, uh, of the old interface of, Nap, of Nap, Napster, sorry. The eruption of this model put it in serious problem the structure that shaped the music industry until the beginning of the second decade in the 21th century. Arriving at the second decade of the current century, streaming technology was consolidated and it is no longer necessary to download files for music consumption. Instead, the reproduction, as we know, is carried out on online. However, a feature from the previous pre uh, period that has remained in the streaming moment is the social practice of music uploading, an interactive practice that is still necessary and fundamental for the functioning of the streaming paradise in the current moment. Within this period, we highlight platforms such as Spotify or Bandcamp that bully diverse self profiles both between the narrative that each platform construct among themselves and also the narrative that they contribute to building in the profile of their users. Spotify has consolidated agreements with major record companies, crystallizing modifications in the system of music production, circulation and consumption. The most part of the specialist literature considers Spotify like one of the fundamental actors in the music industry renaissance. Bandcamp, for the other hand, has consolidated itself communicatively and financially on the basis of an alternative narrative of music and popular culture. In this context, different authors study one or the other platform to describe the behavior of media interaction in this new and changing context. It should be noted that researcher in this field, with some exception, uh, focus uh, their analyze in this type of platforms from perspective orientated to the user consumer in other words, the user of the platform who interacts with the media from the point of view of consumption. As we will see throughout the presentation, we will concentrate on aspect linked to what we call users content creators within the research project <clears throat> to which I belong. That is to say, we will concentrate on the instance of production describing some particularities uh, in the uploading process or of on Spotify and some difference with the case of Bandcamp. Among the possibilities that the digital era offers independent to artists, Bandcamp is one of the most important today. It is a platform specifically designed for independent creators and actors who occupy marginal positions in the industry. Although there are uh, no cases of marketing strategy, constructing alternative interaction proposal to those that have been consolid consolidated as the as pillars of, of the industry. In other words, they bull bullet identifications with an alternative artist archetype. We will return to this uh, narrative aspects and this type of platform, uh, platforms in future works. There are other type of platforms uh, similar like SoundCloud, but it's not the case today. Okay, the next slide shows uh, a piece of um, interface uh, inside of Bandcamp each platform is basically an online music shop 
as well as uh, launch and promotion platforms for independent artists. It opened its website in September of 2008, and by 2012, it already had a catalog of more than 5 million songs. The interactional shame that Bandcamp proposed to users, creators of content is free and direct. That is to say, without uh, any type of intermediary actors and even offer the possibility of selling track at price set by the artist. The price offer available includes the product free of charge. Summaring, this platform of offers a direct uploading service. <clears throat> this slide show fragments of the interface with distributed product. As you can see, it also allows the possibility of selling physical products, like a cassette in this case. Um, it, <coughs> it is worth nothing within the online so store sales option. Bandcamp recovered the practice of pay downloading files as one of its service. Uh, that is to say, um, it's a permanence of the first period of the networking moment. Now we some watch uh, some features of Spotify. Since its first development in 2006, this company has reached 50 million of songs by July of 2019. The platform has an ad supported free access mode as well as a premium system. Spotify maintains agreements <coughs> with record companies, both majors and independents while offering the possibility for any internet user to upload sound content to the platform through the music uploading process, which is uh, different from the uh, Bandcamp case. <clears throat> um, this, uh, well, Spotify have uh, characters from the broadcasting moment and some characters, some features of the networking moment. <clears throat> we can see it uh, in the fact that all actors such as big record labels or the most established artists in the industry realize their phonograms maintaining the interactional model that we have graphed with a pyramid. At the same time, this these features coexist with the reticular interconnectation in on platforms. From 2019 onwards, the company forces for the music uploading of small and medium-sized players, a process in which the intervention of other media platform, <clears throat> the so-called uh, digital content distributors is mandatory. The process is carried out through a fee-based exchange of service. In other words, unlike Bandcamp, Spotify offers content to creators, uh, an indirect uploading process and the payment system is applied to the user content creator, unlike Bandcamp, where it is the, the user consumer who have to pay. Digital content distribution or digital aggregators are media platforms that assume an intermediary role between users who create content and the music streaming platforms. Some of most famous cases are iMusician and CD Baby. Okay, through these platforms, uploading is carried out according the following steps. First, the user, the user access to the distributor sites and create a profile, choose between the different service offering where prices vary according to the amount of content to be uploaded at the streaming platform where the distribution is required. The service offering offered not only digital distribution, but also 
worldwide CD and vinyl, vinyl distribution service, TV, film, and video game, uh, sync listening, and too many other uh, services. Uh, well, okay, the two images above are from the distribution offer displayed on iMusician and CD Baby uh, platforms. For each product uploaded to the platform, uh, there is necessary two files. A sound file, it can be um, WEV, MP3, or WMA, I think that is in my English. I don't know if my English is perfect, but and an image file, usually JPG or GPA. Some distributors, such as iMusician, provide in their interface the possibility to create covers for the product using a graphic template. The image below is a screenshot of the interface during a part of the product process. That, just that. Um, <coughs> it is worth nothing that distributors such as those mentioned above have started to offer an instant mastering service. That is, in addition to offering circulation service, they offer the option of finalizing the production of the phonogram in an online mode that is inside of the platform. It is important to say that mastering practice is considered the last step in the music production of a sound, uh, sound pass. It proposed is to balance the sound elements to optimize the quality the quality of its exclusively to the work uh, in, a, in, other, in other time uh, in the rise of broadcasting, this social practice was linked exclusively to uh, song engineers, music studios, music producers. Now, uh, it have been partially absorbed by this type of platforms. Step D, the aggregator distributes the content to the streaming platforms and notify the user of the release date of the product. This chain exposed the distribution path of the music test. As we'll, we'll see, this is not the end of the uploading process on Spotify. Spotify have two platforms that operate in parallel. Spotify streaming identified with a green color and Spotify for artists, a parallel platform identified with blue color. It is a platform specifically designed for users con um, creator of content. Spotify for artists handles the reception and management of content distributed by digital aggregators platforms, providing the user content creator with access to a data traffic system displayed in graphical format, which aims to provide information to maximize the circulation of the phonogram. The platform also proposed a default email service providing useful information to improve the musician's self-management in a constantly and changing media context. Spotify artist ensures the creation of a verified artist profile, which is characterized by this blue mark that we can see in the screenshot. The screenshot belongs a um, profile of a music production collective that our research project had been studying both online and offline realities. As you can see the mark, uh, okay, this is the, the mark of verified artist. The artist profile must be created at the same time that the user do the first upload in digital distributors. Finally, when the distributed content arrived to Spotify for artists, the platform sends an identity verification email to the user email addresses. Once the identity is verified, uh, the verified artist account is activated with the first contact ready to be played 
by user consumers from Spotify streaming platform. Provisional conclusions. Um, the streaming moment presents a wide range of interactional possibilities in terms of music uploading. The post-broadcasting moment, that is the current moment, presents a media landscape with hybridizations between broadcasting and network models and hybridizations between different moments of networking. For example, in the continuity of downloading in the mediatic life of Bandcamp. In other words, autonomy in terms of content management increased, but the media landscape become more complex. The autonomy possessed by creator of context covers not only stage of the circulation and music consumption, but as we have seen, it's also rich aspects linked to the production stage, for example, the mastering alternative offered by digital content distributors that we have seen. The possibilities offered by uploading at the moment of streaming change between at least two interactive shams, that is direct and indirect. In the basis of these shams that the media profile of user content creator are bullied. In some cases, this profile have to be replicated or on intermediary platforms in order to ensure uh, that the content reach to the streaming platforms. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe turn off your microphone because there is an echo. Uh, all the time. <laughs> no, no, just w w w while I'm talking. Ah, okay, okay. No, no it was I, perfect. I just it was put perfect. this. Thank you. Okay, let's try. Okay. Hello. You. Okay, it's fine. Hi. Emiliano. Thank you. Thank you, Emiliano, uh, for your uh, clear uh, recognition about these platforms. Uh, we are working on a very interesting new context. Uh, as I said before, I leave the question for the last part, if, you, if we have enough time. And I immediately introduced our last but not least speaker, uh, Professor Cristina Voto. Uh, Cristina Voto, uh, who is a colleague of mine, is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Turin, again, in the, uh, in the project Facets. Uh, Facets. She is professor in semiotics at the University of Tres de Febrero, Buenos Aires, and the curator for, uh, of the Biennial of the Moving Image of Buenos Aires. <clears throat> she is also a member of uh, several associations uh, related to semiotics, film studies, um, media studies, graphics, and so on and so forth. She has written articles for peer-reviewed journals and given lectures in Italy, Spain, England, Argentina, and Colombia. She has worked as a programmer and a curator in film festivals and biennials. She was a lecturer at the University of Buenos Aires and the University of La Matanza, uh, Buenos Aires. And she was a visiting professor uh, at uh, Jorge Tadeo Lozano University at Bogota and a visiting researcher at the National University of Colombia. So a lot of uh, um, a, a very rich uh, uh, curriculum vitae. Uh, and uh, today, Christina presents uh, a paper entitled Non-Facial Portraits, the face in between artificial and human agency. Uh, please, Christina, the floor is yours. Okay, so thanks. Thanks to the organizer and thanks to Bruno for this kind uh, presentation. I hope you can already see my PowerPoint. Can you please just give me a feedback? We see it. Okay, thank you. So um, the main aim of my presentation is try to um, unveiling or unmasking certain areas of meaning linked to a semiotic of the face in the field of AI and digital arts. Framing the problem of the face through artistic languages that use computer technologies and artificial intelligence requires focusing on a series of premises necessary for the construction of the object under analysis. So here we would go. The face. Okay. 
Yes, so the phase is studied here as a dynamic dispositive that os os oscillates between the natural world and the cultural universe. And in this flu fluctuation, it innervates a network of semiotics, expressive and communicative uh, relationships capable of framing the image par, excell par excellence of the human being. It is a complex image, of course, at once a semiotic mediation between interior interiority and exteriority, and an interface between the singularity of the individual and the plurality of society. So the, med the mediatization that allows the phase is um, when it's declined in the field of AI and digital arts, uh, opens up a whole series of issues related to the digitalization of visual culture, the spread of communication and information technologies, the research increasingly uh, focusing on cognitive reproduction of um, use of network, uh, so, sorry, artwork and software. So visual continuity effects such as morphing or the surveillance tool of pan of panoptic reminiscences and machine learning programming models um, are just one of the technology increasingly used in the field of artistic experimentation. In this, in this sense, if we accept as valid the hypothesis that modern Western society is a fascial society, as already suggested by Thomas Macho at the end of the last century in 1996, it should be not difficult to recognize in the current pers pervasiveness of faces produced through digital or AI technology, a faciality that challenges us with, the, with new questions on the dynamic of recognition of singularity and for end of otherness. So defining this phase as a dispositive also implies recognizing the performativity of facial models that circulates in a given culture. In this sense, we can just um, remember some um, inquiries like those of Jeanne Rivera at the beginning of the last century, where she defines femininity as a mask, or Ronald Barth's analysis of the face of Greta Garbo defined as a face, of, as a face object, or Laura Mulvey's reflection on the scopophilia of classical Hollywoodian cinema. And these three examples, of course, just um, just uh, as in, in a quick review, they account for the effects of an agentivity that modifies, transforms, and reproduces social cultural facialities. But what happens when the material condition of this agentivity, of this facial performing, are artificial? Um, since the first study in, in, the, in the field of the recognition of facial partners by artificial intelligence, and we can just remember the first study in, published in 1963 by Woody Bledsoe and Matitians, a study that was titled A Proposal for a Study to Determine the Feasibility of a Simplified Face Recognition Machine, there has been a widespread diffusion of artificial facial images. From the manufacturing industry to the insurance sector, from healthcare to finance, from social media to development of smart city, from surveillance in airports, shopping center, or just the artistic practice, we face with artificial faces. So this flood of faciality that reconfigures aesthetic aspect and biopolitical dynamics of the face, it led us to witness to an accelerated digital, digitalization of culture and the process of technological transformation that has led to the reconstruction of reality on the basis of a binary standardization and what we can call in semiotic terms um, a dematerialization of the signifier. In this content, context, uh, thanks to the development of artificial vision, otherwise known as computer vision, and the implementation of algorithms capable of automating the construction of perceptual models, artificial intelligence systems are now able not only to detect or recognize faces, to identify or verify them, but also to produce them artificially through automated uh, pr pr procedures and inferences, as in the case of facial images uh, produced through deep learning and by generative adversarial um, networks. 
on closer inspection of this phenomenon occur in an iconosphere in which most images are produced and, and consumed by the same algorithms that cover the govern artificial intelligence and vision. Paul Virilio defines this technology, defined because he, he did it in, in, the, in 1989. Uh, so he defined this technology as machines that see, while Trevor Paglen more recently speaks about invisible images to define the flow of images produced by machines and for machines. So this, this, this context opens up a territory of hybridizations between natural and artificial intelligence that, to my standpoint, needs urgently to be understood and analyzed. Reflecting on the production of um, artificial facial, um, facial images in digital and AI arts places us within a territory of intersemiotic visualization, a territory of level of commensurability between natural and artificial intelligence. This territory is to be Im imagined as a, as a space where we can trace those facial images belonging to digital iconosphere whose faciality is considered as a product of artificial agentivity. In a theory of semiotics, uh, Umberto Eco states that uh, um, the iconic sign do not have um, the same physical prop uh, properties uh, as the object, but it simulates a perceptual structure similar to that which would be simulated by imitating the object. So recovering Eco's lesson, lessons and applying it to the intersemiotic in uh, territory um, implies to be able to trace levels of similarity between the recognition of facial images produced by an, a human agentivity and one produced by artificial agentivity. In the light of this level, it will be possible to identify what these similarities uh, um, stimulate and how to analyze how these stimuli uh, do things. So the current diffusion of artificial facial images resemantizes certain practices that have characterized our societies since immemorial time, uh, such as, of course, the recognition of a face. This ancient practice uh, is interrogated here on the basis of one specific uh, um, aspect and from one digital art artwork. So the aspect is um, the identification as the linking of the face of the image of a face to an individuality and the analysis corpus so the digital the ai and digital artwork is transformed um, into a test bench where, to, where where the following question can be tested how can the phenomena of individual um, individuation be framed when it is the effect of an artificial ag agentivity so okay so bearing these questions in mind i consider ai art as a very fertile field for dialogue and contact between human and artificial intelligence in this sense ai art is here understood as a human field that implies algorithms as materials, as tools for the creation of art, an artistic piece. I will now show you a teaser of this installation that combine AI arts and uh, more plastic traditional arts, and we will see how. The installation is called non facial Portrait, and it's uh, realized in 2018 by a, a duo, a Korean duo uh, based in Seoul. And the, um, the artwork was commissioned by Seoul Media City Biennale. So uh, the duo asked it to 10 painters to make the portrait of one same per person, but the painters had one route to follow. The painting of the face must not have been detected by three different automated face recognition technologies, three algorithm of face recognition that monitored the pictorial practices, but the final piece would have uh, to be formally and compositionally recognizable within the, the, the portrait 
artistic genre. So this is the dialogue between artificial and um, human uh, agentivity. So the artistic genre of the portrait as a genre as a genre associated with the identity. So and with the topic of uh, um, individuation. The result of this tricky exercise in style was organized in an installation that deals with faciality as a territory of semiosis, where the different aesthetics, visual and cognitive and textual, of course, meanings that, arise, that rise around face and identity can make visible the tensions that exist between artificial and human agencies. And here I show you the trailer. So you can see the squares, no? the, the eye of the algorithm that it's um, monitoring the practices and the reaction of the painter um, through this uh, monitoration. And these are one of the results. Now, we, if we have time, I, I will show you uh, some other videos later. And this is the final installation. So those are the 10 portraits. And this is the list of the participants. Okay, so So generally speaking, automated facial recognition is a technology that installs itself on the threshold of complex negotiation between extremely dense issues such as, con such as those concerning recognition, identity, and access to policies to the right of, of citizenship. The, dissemin the dissemination of automated face recognition technologies confront us with a question about our contemporary visual culture concerning the problem of the dissemination of disembodied identities. And here I'm quoting, uh, I'm quoting the um, US scholar Kelly Gates, um, who in 2011 uh, trying to um, to frame this problem about the disembodied identities as the existence of visual and textual representation of bodies that circulate independent, independently of physical bodies and that are recognized through a disembodied visual perception. So to reflect on the threshold between human and artificial agency about visual recognition, it faces us with a, at least three questions. So the first question is a con concern the automated facial recognition technology as a form of machine vision that is used to recognize human beings and yet operates on scenes since, since it involves an invisible operation. Its recognition processes are inaccessible to the uninitiated, let's say. So yet this technology in increasingly governs people's uh, lives in various um, institutional contexts. Uh, so one question that emerged from this first um, threshold is what is the process no, through which uh, recognition is, defini is defined in computer, in computer vision. So a second tensions concerned continuity and discontinuity between machine visual perception and organic human uh, visual perception. And we can ask ourselves what historical continuities and discontinuities can be identified in recognition processes. And finally, a third tensions concern the relationships between the recognition processes in an automated facial recognition system and the type of knowledges that it can produce. So indeed, a successful automatic recognition operation results in a production of information that is often able to act on a subject's identity. So, and here is like the last question and the last 
and maybe most important question for this presentation today. So how do artistic practices um, that use facial recognition technology, how they, can they respond, articulate or, or address is the implication of using these same technologies? Okay, so, but maybe we have to, uh, before to go to the artificial AI arts, maybe it's better to have a step back and think about uh, um, the long-term relation that we have with images produced by non-human agentivity. Um, I'm referring to the studies of, um, concerning face, about faces of Massimo Leone, where he points out to um, long-lasting and dial um, dialoguing tradition concerning Akero Poieta, I don't know if I pronounced it well in English, facial images that are images produced by a you know, human agentivity, which is a practices or maybe a sign, maybe a little bit better to say, which cross visual culture from east to west, from north to south. We, here, for example, we have the case of the um, Guadalupe um, Virgin, who is one of the divine, uh, in, in, in this sense, you know, human images uh, um, produced by uh, a divine agentivity. So the access to the representation of the face is historically and still today in a large part of cultures reserved for practices for precise aesthetic and biopolitical conditions. So it, sh it should come as no surprise that even in this kind of images made by you know, human agentivity, uh, facial images are recognized as having a special aura capable of attributing extraordinary powers, images endowed with an absolute authenticity that determines a non-mediated interpretation. And as uh, Leone wrote, and I quote, since the face is so central in human behavior, facial images that are considered as produced by a non-human agency receive a special aura throughout history and culture, as if they were endowed with extraordinary powers. Furthermore, since in many society, the face is read as the most important manifestation of interiority, non-made men, non-man-made images of faces are attributed um, a status of authenticity and um, a, as if they were the most sincere expression of some otherwise invisible agency. And I finished the quote. If we, if, we wait, if we bear in mind these, we can see how these images still continue to generate meaning thanks to a particular process of legitimization to which artificial intelligence has been subjected. And I refer to the mm, process of artification. The expression coined in 2012 by sociologists Natalie Heinick and Roberta Shapiro designates the sociocultural process that consolidates a non-artistic practice, such as, for example, computer science, into an institutionalized artistic discipline, such as, for example, portraiture. Furthermore, there is another as aspect that comes on the top of what Eric Satan uh, defined as the artificial reason, an aletheic process that guarantees the unveiling, the manifestation of the reality of phenomenon beyond their appearance. So the technology underpinning artificial intelligence pretend to be an organ enabled to access reality more reliably than we can then we can and to reveal to us dimension that um, have, no, um, have so far remained hidden from our consciousness. In this, it takes the form of, of a technical logo, or sea, of an artifactual device endowed with the power to tell with either greater precision, precision and immediacy, the theoretical exact state of things. So the combination of a technology that is both artifactual and aletheic updates the erratic dimension of the two traditions described by Leone. So today, automated face recognition technologies seem to be endowed not only with the extraordinary power to conflate 
natural and artificial intelligence, but also to attribute it a status of authenticity to images on the basis of automated inferences that qualifies identity. But what happens, in fact, when the automated intelligence uh, recognition systems uh, recognizes incong incongruities, or better, maybe better to say, when the recognition process of the individuality, rather than revealing a singularity, opacifies or make dense uh, the automated agency. Recovering Luis Maran studies, we can speak about opacity, or maybe better, we can speak about how digital arts is capable to opacify, to mattifying the aletheic promise of the artificial reason while making the automated process of inferencing dense material touchable. And here I'd like to show you how the process can be um, can be considered as opaque. Here we can see the practice of one of the painters and the gestures that he made for making opaque for the opacity of uh, this recognition. So we will see how, okay, I'll let you maybe first see the, the video and then I'll comment it. So this is the final result. The three algorithm systems cannot detect in what we can still recognize as a portrait, the face, a facial, a facial image. So the installation of facial portrait, it is crossed by this opacifying research, a look with which to thicken the rapid transparency of digital technology in order to restore an agentivity to artificial intelligence. Non-facial portrait propose opaque and densely mediatized strategies with which unmask the computer vision process of individual individuation. The monitoring by the facial recognition system acts directly on the tense artist pra uh, painting practice, and what the computer vision identifies as facial stimulate errors, or maybe perhaps it should be better to say erroneous wandering re re representation. The tensions between the error recognized by the artificial intelligence and the artistic wandering of human intelligence is confronted, is confronted with the textual dimension of the portrait. What are the strategies deployed by each painter to circumvent artificial intelligence while remaining within the perimeter of the genre? And I would like to, to show you another example, which I find really interesting also, thinking about um, visual semiotic category, like a um, plastic category, like for example, topological and aesthetic categories. As you can see now, the final strategy of the human agentivity is to dislocate the elements of the face throughout the painting, but 
the final result is still a portrait that won't be recognized by uh, the algorithm. So, and I go to conclusions. With the diffusion of um, artificial intelligence, we are witnessing the transition from a biopolitical mechanism of discipline, disciplining the foc that, that focuses on the individual, as Foucault already said in 1975, and therefore on the dead individuality of subjectivity and plur plurality of society to a biopolitical me mechanism of decomposing the individual into data and recomposing society into me metadata. Disciplines such as biometric or geolocation systems such as GPS, radio frequency, identification technology, data mining, and analyzing um, and analyzing algorithms so all work thanks to a global protocol that aim to resolve identification as data body. And however, as already analyzed by Donna Araway in 1991 with their studies on both on uh, the promises of the monster and the manifesto, cyber manifesto. Um, so as already uh, analyzed by Haraway, a human and the union animals are not transparent entities, but they are opaque, dense materiality. So opacifying matter, whatever it may be, from flesh to beads, or, or from, for example, painting to canvas, become an operation with which to break the, the, the theoretical ideality of transparent representation, a gesture that organizes communicative intentionality and proposes um, a transhuman ethic of the face, a strategy for the construction of interaction with the non-human um, on the base on the basis on of an on an anthropistemological primacies both through a symbiotic interconnection between natural and artificial intelligence that might be able to underline the hybrid and opaque term of, of our existence and i finished and i'd like to thank you for your attention so thank you thank you very much uh, cristina uh, okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think it was a very uh, rich uh, panel. We 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 give three different perspectives on three themes, uh, which in some way are uh, are interrelated. Also, the the one by Emiliano, which in some way doesn't speak directly about faces, but about interfaces, and this. Uh, these uh, two words uh, have something in common, so maybe we can uh, we could find some uh, theoretical bridge. Unfortunately, I think there is no time for uh, uh, questions. So I'll invite uh, uh, someone uh, uh, as urgent uh, um, questions to make. Uh, so um, I, I just finish by saying that uh, the the um, the paper by Emiliano was interesting because. Uh, it provided uh, a kind of uh, philology or geneal genealogy, um, starting from uh, the downloading uh, culture and going uh, to uh, contemporary platforms and their functioning. And uh, mm, it was interesting because uh, it uh, gave us the idea of the connection between the previous culture and these ones, uh, which are strongly connected because the downloading culture was something I, re I remind it because I, I was a, a young uh, boy <laughs> when uh, it was possible to download massively contents. Uh, and uh, um, nowadays uh, we don't use to download things anymore because we have different uh, methods as uh, Emiliano uh, explained. But in some way, we collect uh, our, uh, our, uh, our music, uh, for example, by putting uh, like uh, the heart uh, on Spotify and so on and so forth. So 
in the in the in the context of practices there are some connection and you uh, pinpointed that uh, them uh, very well so thank you Emiliano um, the, the 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 paper by Christina was of course uh, very well uh, uh, informed with the theoretical uh, sources maybe the 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 the, the last uh, thing to say is that usually we think technology is something which implies philosophical problems and we think that these philosophical problems are only related to the technology itself but Christina showed us that for example we can use technology to develop a philosophy also related to pre-technological issues the problem of iconicity uh, uh, which uh, uh, was a, a problem opened by Umberto Eco, the problem of what does it mean to, to detect similarities? What, is, what, what really is an iconic sign is a pre-technological problem, but with this uh, philosophical reflection, we can go back into that problem. And this is a kind of a epistemological shift. I think we, we should work uh, on it uh, more and more. So. Thank you both. Um, I, I thank you, the organizer, again. I know now there is a master lectures uh, by uh, Euripides Zantides and Sonia Andreo uh, in another room. So uh, you are invited to, to, to join it. And uh, Christina, you want to say something? Yes. If you just let me, Bruno, I'd like to thank you for your brilliant presentation because I think that to have the opportunity to go back to such dense and complex questions concerning semiotics, such as the figurative and figural topic, which, as you have, as you and other scholar already have underlined, it's a really com confused. I, if I don't remember bad, also Garofalo spoke about a kind of confusing topic about the the, to the, the, the problem. So to go back and trying to focus those blurring uh, concept within popular culture. I think it's really a, a great effort that we as a, a semiotician, we have to do. So I really thank you for your efforts to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina, for your uh, considerations. And we, we will have occasion to reflect on this theme. Uh, and thank you again, Emiliano. So. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, goodbye. Bye bye. Bye bye, Teresa. Thank you.